Hello, and thank you for the invitation to join you at your Congress. I'm sorry I can't be with you there in person, but I'll be joining you um, by Zoom for questions at the end of this presentation. First, my statement of interest. Now about GINA, the Global Initiative for Asthma. It was established uh, nearly 30 years ago with the goal of increasing awareness about asthma and improving asthma prevention and management through a coordinated worldwide effort. GINA is independent. It's funded only by the sale and licensing of its reports and figures. The GINA report is a global evidence-based strategy that can be adapted for local health systems and medicine availability. It's very widely used with around 500,000 copies of GINA reports downloaded each year from over 100 countries. It has a very practical focus with multiple flow charts and tables. The GINA strategy report is updated every year based on a twice yearly cumulative review of new evidence across the whole asthma strategy. And that includes reviewing published grade reviews when they're available. We pay careful attention to the clinical relevance of study designs and the generalizability of populations. And there's extensive external review. For a detailed description of GINA methodology, uh, you can see it on the GINA website. Now first, about diagnosis of asthma. The definition of asthma includes two key components, variable respiratory symptoms and variable expiratory airflow limitation. And so it's very important to test before treating whenever this is possible, because it's often more difficult to confirm the diagnosis after inhaled corticosteroids are started because inhaled corticosteroids decrease symptoms and they decrease variability in lung function and airway hyperresponsiveness. Unfortunately, spirometry alone does not rule in or rule out asthma. And so in many situations, more than one test is needed. The GINA flowchart about asthma diagnosis has been updated to emphasize the different approach that you need to take for the initial diagnosis of asthma compared with in patients who are already taking control of treatment. So the flowchart starts with a um, patient with respiratory symptoms and asking the questions, are these symptoms typical of asthma? If they're not, then you need to undertake further history and tests for those alternative diagnoses. But otherwise, take a detailed history and examination for asthma. And does that support an asthma diagnosis? And then consider whether the patient is already taking asthma controller treatment. And you'll see on the left that um, there are two boxes in the GINA report that show you the diagnostic steps in patients who are already on controller treatment. But otherwise, um, the first step is normally to perform spirometry or peak flow with a reversibility test. Uh, and if that's negative, then uh, other tests can be arranged. There is also the opportunity if there's clinical urgency and if other diagnoses are unlikely for an empirical initial treatment and then review of the response. But again, try to undertake diagnostic testing within one to three months. Asthma is often underdiagnosed in low and middle income countries, and it's particularly difficult because the differential diagnosis often includes other endemic respiratory diseases, such as tuberculosis, HIV AIDS associated lung disease, and parasitic or fungal lung diseases. So a syndromic approach is often used for the initial phase of diagnosis. But as I mentioned, uh, Gina recommends confirmation of the asthma diagnosis with lung function testing whenever possible before you start long term treatment. Now, ideally, that should be with spirometry uh, and with trained operators and calibrated equipment. If spirometry is not available, then peak expiratory flow can be used. The WHO suggests a 20% increase in peak flow 15 minutes after two puffs of salbutamol. And an alternative is to look for improvement in symptoms and in peak flow after about four weeks of inhaled corticosteroid treatment. 
However, as you will be well aware, access to affordable diagnostic equipment and skills training needs to be substantially scaled up in low and middle income countries. I want to move on now to management and starting with the risks of mild asthma. Patients who have apparently mild asthma are still at risk of serious adverse events. And this is one of the most important messages to convey. In several studies, around a third of adults presenting to the emergency department with acute asthma had symptoms less than weekly in the previous three months. And 16% of patients with near fatal asthma and 15 to 20% of adults dying of asthma, likewise, had symptoms less than weekly in the previous three months. And you can imagine that the patient would not think that they are at risk of such serious outcomes if they have infrequent symptoms. In addition, exacerbation triggers are unpredictable. Viruses, pollens, pollution, weather. And although oral corticosteroids are life-saving during acute severe asthma, even four or five lifetime courses of oral corticosteroids increase the risk of adverse outcomes such as osteoporosis, diabetes, cataract, stroke and heart failure. So we cannot ignore the risks of apparently mild asthma. Now, as you know, low dose inhaled corticosteroids are extremely effective in asthma. They reduce hospitalizations by 31% and reduce asthma deaths by more than 50%. And in patients with mild asthma in the START study, low dose inhaled steroids almost halved the risk of serious exacerbations. And this was seen even in patients who had symptoms once a week or less at the start of the study as seen on the left hand side here. However, very few patients take inhaled corticosteroids regularly. They rely on their short acting beta agonist reliever instead. Now from the patient's perspective, taking a short acting beta agonist for rapid symptom relief with an occasional course of oral corticosteroids is a very satisfactory treatment option for mild asthma. However, poor adherence is associated with an increased risk of severe exacerbations and death. And if patients overuse their SARPA, that's associated with an increased risk of exacerbations and death. In addition, starting treatment with a short acting beta agonist trains the patient to regard it as their primary asthma treatment. So clearly evidence was needed for a safe and efficacious alternative for treatment of mild asthma. So as you might remember, in 2019, we had that evidence for a fundamental change in GINA recommendations. The treatment of asthma with short acting bronchodilators alone is no longer recommended for adults and adolescents. To summarize the evidence supporting these recommendations, the most important is that compared with as needed short acting beta agonist, which is the treatment that most patients with mild asthma are taking, the risk of severe exacerbations was reduced by 60 to 64 percent, and this was seen in Sigma 1 and Novel Start. And then compared with the previous standard of care maintenance low dose inhaled corticosteroids, the risk of severe exacerbations was similar in the Sigma studies and lower in Novel Start and Practical, the two open label studies. In terms of other outcomes, symptoms were slightly more, so an asthma control test an asthma control questionnaire of difference of 0.15 compared with the minimal important difference of 0.5, a slightly lower FEV1 around 50 mils, and slightly higher airway inflammation around 10 parts per billion. But each of these three outcomes was stable over 12 months. There was no progressive worsening. On average, patients used the as-needed inhaler on around 30% of days, so the average inhaled corticosteroid dose was around 50 to 100 micrograms of budesonide a day. In terms of looking at the predictors of response, the outcomes for severe exacerbations and for symptom control were independent of baseline characteristics, including for blood eosinophils and pheno, lung function and history of exacerbations. Further evidence was available in 
2022 for inclusion in the GINA report. And this came from a meta-analysis of all four clinical trials in just under 10,000 patients by the Cochrane Collaboration. And this confirmed the large reduction in severe exacerbations compared with short-acting beta agonist alone and the similar risk of severe exacerbations as with daily inhaled corticosteroid and as needed short acting beta agonist. What was new was that emergency department visits or hospitalizations were again two thirds lower with as needed ICS fomoterol compared with Sabra alone, but also significantly lower with the as needed ICS fomoterol regimen compared with daily inhaled corticosteroid plus as needed Saba. So a, a, a more than one third reduction in emergency visits or hospitalization translates into a large signal at a population level. Additional new evidence included analysis by previous treatment in the SIGMA studies. And um, this confirmed what was seen in the novel START study that patients who were previously taking short acting beta agonist alone did better with the as needed ICS fomoterol regimen compared with if they were randomized to the regular inhaled corticosteroid regimen. It's highly likely that they struggled more with adherence, um, having not been taking regular treatment before. Just a quick reminder about maintenance and reliever therapy in steps three to five. This re uh, reduces the risk of severe exacerbations compared with inhaled corticosteroid or ICS LABA regimens with a SABA reliever with similar symptom control. And uh, in many countries worldwide, maintenance and reliever therapy is approved for bidacinide formoterol and beclomethasone formoterol. And you can see here on the left, the reduction in risk of severe exacerbations compared with the same dose or higher dose of ICS LABA and compared with conventional best practice. And then in uh, the study on the right, where all patients were taking maintenance budesonide formoterol, the risk of severe exacerbations was reduced if their reliever was as needed formoterol compared with the as needed Saba in green. But the risk of severe exacerbations was lowest if the reliever was the combination of ICS formoterol. I want to look, first I want to look at this uh, arid circle at the top, which emphasizes the key features of asthma management. First, when you're assessing it, not just symptom control, but also modifiable risk factors or so-called treatable traits, um, inhaler technique and adherence and patient preferences and goals. And then treatment is not just the treatment with medications, but also treating those modifiable risk factors and comorbidities, non-pharmacological strategies, and education and skills training, including an action plan. And then when you are assessing the response, not just asking about symptoms and measuring lung function, but also asking about exacerbations, side effects, and patient satisfaction. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the treatment figure is shown in two tracks. And track one has as needed low dose ICS formoterol as the reliever on its own in steps one and two, and then with maintenance ICS formoterol in steps three, four, and five. This track um, and as needed low dose ICS formoterol as the reliever is the preferred track because as I've shown to you, using ICS formoterol as reliever reduces the risk of severe exacerbations compared with using a Saba reliever. Track two is still there though, because not everyone has access to ICS formoterol. And also some patients have been very stable for years on um, a treatment with a Saba reliever without exacerbations and being uh, having good adherence. 
However, when you are considering a regimen with a Saba reliever, you need to check if the patient is likely to be adherent with daily controller, because if they aren't, they're at increased risk of exacerbations. So in TRAP2, step one is taking inhaled steroid whenever Saba is taken. Step two has low dose maintenance ICS, and then the remaining steps have um, maintenance ICS LABA. And then at the bottom of the treatment figure are some additional controller options for either track that have either limited indications or have less evidence for efficacy or safety. And uh, this is a treatment figure that shows where you might start treatment in adults and adolescents with a diagnosis of asthma, depending on their baseline symptom frequency. For patients with mild asthma, if as needed ICS for Motorola is not, is not available, then another option is to take inhaled corticosteroid whenever the SABA is taken. Now there's much less robust evidence for this than for in the ICS for Motorola studies, but these two studies here have shown that SABA only treatment is the worst option. On the left, um, published in 2007, a study using combination beclomethas and salbutamol. And this showed in blue that the worst option in terms of severe exacerbations was as needed salbutamol alone. And the option and the regimen with the least exacerbations was as needed beclomethas and salbutamol. A study was ca carried out in children and adolescents published in 2011 uh, using separate beclomethasone and salbutamol inhalers. And uh, you can see here again in blue that the SABA only treatment arm had the, uh, the greatest number of exacerbations. And in purple here, the children who took their ICS whenever they took their SABA, in this study they were taped together, um, had a, a trend to fewer exacerbations than the Saber only arm. There have been two more studies also using separate inhalers with ICS taken whenever Saber was taken. In the basalt study here on the top in patients with mild asthma, symptom-based adjustment taking ICS whenever Saber was taken had um, a similar reduction in severe exacerbations compared with phys six weekly physician adjusted treatment and six weekly pheno adjusted treatment. And then a study with separate in inhalers in children and adolescents showed similar symptom control and similar exacerbations compared with physician adjusted treatment. I want to move on briefly to other changes in GINA 2022 medication recommendations for adults and adolescents. So um, we've emphasized that long acting muscarinic antagonists, LAMAs, should not be used as monotherapy for asthma, in other words, without inhaled corticosteroids, because of a cohort study showing that they have an increased risk of severe exacerbations. The, uh, a, a, the benefit of adding a LAMA to ICS LABA was uh, examined in a grade review and meta-analysis published last year. And this showed only a small increase in lung function and no clinically important benefits for symptoms or quality of life. So the take home message from this is that LAMA should not be added for patients whose predominant symptom is dyspnea. Add on LAMA, provided a modest overall reduction in exacerbations compared with ICS LABA. Um, but um, patients with exacerbations should receive at least medium dose ICS LABA before considering adding on a LAMA. And then uh, one other note was that chromium uh, pressurized metered dose inhalers, sodium chromoglycate and docromol sodium, have been discontinued globally, although they, it seems as if very few patients were using these. The GINA 2022 report uh, includes more information about the management of asthma in low and middle income countries. And this is crucially important, as you know, because 96% of asthma deaths are in low and middle income countries. And much of this burden is avoidable, particularly with inhaled corticosteroids. 
Now, as you know, there are many barriers to asthma care in low and middle income countries, particularly the lack of access to essential inhaled medications, but also the prioritisation of acute care over chronic care by health systems. Given the evidence I've shown you, the greatest overall benefit globally would be from markedly increasing access to low dose ICS for motorol. But if that's not available, then um, the advice should be to choose the most effective in terms of uh, reducing risk of exacerbations and the safest available medication. However, throughout the GINA 2022 report, we've described maintenance oral corticosteroids as last resort because of its serious long-term adverse effects. And so uh, to achieve change in low and middle income countries, GINA strongly supports the initiative by the union, the IUATLD, towards a World Health Assembly resolution on equitable access to affordable care for asthma. There are also many regional, local and local initiatives, and I know there are many in Vietnam. Uh, the importance of advocacy and lobbying for increased access to effective medications. But we also need evidence from low and middle income countries for the feasibility and effectiveness of the treatments that um, I've described. Training of health professionals is important, not just doctors, but also pharmacists and nurses. And um, we need to think about undergraduate as well as continuing education. It's important to understand the local context of um, access to medications in the health system, of cost, of stigma and concerns. And we want to emphasise the importance of doing the basics well. Diagnosis, early treatment, inhaler technique and adherence so that every microgram of available medication is used effectively. I just want to finish briefly with um, showing you the treatment figure for children 6 to 11 years, um, showing the options that are available. So uh, several options available here in steps 3 and 4 for children of this age group. But still the key recommendation because of the level of evidence is for daily low dose inhaled corticosteroid as a step 2 treatment. So far there are no studies with as needed ICS for motorol in this age group, but studies are underway. And then uh, for children 5 years and younger, um, the addition of considering intermittent short course inhaled corticosteroids at the onset of viral illness in children with infrequent viral wheezing and no or few interval symptoms. However, it's essential to consider uh, side effects, uh, particularly um, if, the children if the children have frequent viral infections. I just want to finish with a slide about COVID-19 and asthma. Um, there's a set of slides about COVID-19 and asthma on the GINA website, and these are updated during the year as new evidence becomes available. So in 2022, further evidence confirms that patients who have well-controlled asthma are not at increased risk of severe COVID or of COVID-19 related death. However, the risk is higher in patients who've required oral corticosteroids for their asthma and in hospitalised patients with severe asthma. Interestingly, many countries saw a real decrease in asthma exacerbations during the pandemic lockdown stages. And this was likely due to social distancing, use of masks and hand washing that reduced exposure to additional respiratory viruses, including influenza. It's essential um, during COVID and um, to continue to emphasize the need for patients to continue their ICS containing treatment and to have an action plan so that they know what to do if their asthma is worse. The advice about aerosol generating procedures has been updated in 2022. So for spirometry, an inline filter reduces the risk of transmission during spirometry, but patients often cough after spirometry. So you should encourage them to stay on the mouthpiece if they feel that they're going to need to cough. 
And then uh, about vaccinations, um, we've clarified the advice that influenza vaccin vaccination and COVID vaccination can be done on the same day. But we suggest that for patients who are on biologic therapy that the first dose and COVID-19 vaccine should not be given on the same day so that the adverse effects of either of them can be more easily distinguished. So as I mentioned, there's a full set of COVID-19 slides available on the GINA website. And most of the slides I've shown are available as a slideshow um, about updates on, in the GINA 2022 report that is available on the GINA website for academic and educational purposes. So thank you very much for your time and I'll join you shortly for questions. Thank you.